are fragile. I want us to sketch out the right man. We just need enough details for someone who knows him. It won't work. No one knows him. I heard this morning. City workers found a body from a young woman called Julia. Six years ago, I was cut up like her. What someone did to Julia, they tried it into you. If you try to be a reporter, then this is your story. After what he did, things aren't how they should be. It starts with little things. And then big things. And nobody remembers anything different. There are multiple women dead over multiple decades. He's the one connecting them. There'll be more. I don't know how. But he's been watching me since I was a kid. He's everybody. He's nobody. He's all the time. Why are, Why are you doing this? How, How are you doing this? Just because something hasn't happened doesn't mean it won't. We're all connected. Things change for me just like that. And then it happens again, and again, and again. You shouldn't be here. What's his name? Who's the man who visits you? Uh, hi, uh, welcome to the program, um, uh, Serial Killers in the Chicago Sun-Times, uh, as part of the Chicago Public Library. My name is Josh. I am newspaper librarian here at the Harold Washington Library downtown, uh, where last summer um, we had a, a station dedicated to the Shining Girls researcher team. Uh, we had props in here looking at the Sun-Times. We had... Um, uh, researchers helping all, all aspects of the show, uh, looking through news stories, uh, both uh, to integrate into the plot of the show, I assume, and also to um, help design the look of the show. Um, so that's our connection to the, the, um, the show. I, I noticed some filming all around town, all around my neighborhood. Um, but we've got a couple of people involved in the production of the show here with us today. Uh, Soka Luisa, uh, who's the creator of the show. Uh, Martha Sparrow, who's the art director of the show. And then we also have uh, Richard Cahan, who uh, worked for the Sun-Times. If you can tell from the trailer there, the Sun-Times is a major part of uh, the plot of the show and the book uh, on which it's based. And so uh, Richard worked at the Sun-Times as photo editor in the time period where the show is, is set. So he'll come in and uh, give us some uh, uh, insight into the show, uh, what the show gets right, and his experiences, and all that sort of thing. Uh, but yeah, I first want to introduce uh, Soka Lucia. Hello. Hi, nice to meet you. Hi, nice to meet you. Um, so yeah, like I said, you're the creator of the show. And so perhaps this is a simplistic question, I don't really know. But when it comes to a pre-existing material, uh, in this case, a book uh, by Lauren Bukes, uh, and I just realized that uh, it's in the other room and I was going to hold it up uh, all professional-like, but it's next to me. I can't grab it. I have a copy um, in the other room, too. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, good book. Uh, check it out, definitely. Um, yeah, so what is the role of a creator when something pre-exists? Did you like uh, conceive of the idea of making a show based on this book? Uh, was the was the show already conceived and you shepherd the adaptation? Can you tell me what a creator does in this situation? Absolutely. So the there's a studio and they actually own the rights to the book. So I had read the book just as a fan, as a reader, as somebody who loves genre. Um, it came out in 2013. And for many, many years, the studio had the right to the book and they were trying to develop it as a feature. 
I think they had a hard time with that just because the nature of the book, it, the narrative is so sprawling. It was really hard to capture that in two hours. Mm -hmm. And so they, um, they were open to doing it as a TV show. And since I was such a huge fan of the book, I really went after the, after the job. And um, I had a take on it. So you come in, you've read the book, and then you have a take. You know, if I was going to do a TV show, this is this is how I would do it. This is how I would translate the novel experience into a TV experience. Um, you know, and then they give you notes on that, and then you write a pilot. You attach uh, Elizabeth Moss. You set it up at Apple TV Plus, um, and then you make a TV show. Okay. Um, so yeah, I noticed you write, uh, wrote or uh, listed as creator on all the episodes, obviously, and wrote two of the episodes. Um, but I'm sure you were involved in the writing. Oh, three. I'm sorry. IMDb is all wrong. I don't know. It's okay. Can't trust IMDb. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I'm sure you were involved with the writing and production and all elements. Um, yeah. So as showrunner, you you basically run the writer's room. So there's other writers. You, you, you write the first episode, then you start the writer's room. Um, we had five other writers and you break the season together. And then, you know, each each writer farms off an episode and we all look at it together. Okay. Um, yeah, and I, I, I will have a couple of questions about the process of adaptation and a few things, but, um, uh, 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 well, I guess I can get right into that. Like, um, the, I've read the book and I've seen the first two episodes and um, we, we won't get into the, the nitpicky things about the differences between the book and the show. That's not terribly interesting. But like, I was wondering um, in the book, the lead character Kirby, who in the TV show is played by Elizabeth Moss, um, is very sort of snarky riot girl uh, using like Gen X irony to sort of deflect from her trauma and everything. And uh, the character Kirby is portrayed in the show as a lot more um, grim, uh, more um, mournful. Um, and I was wondering if that was a decision that you had made early on or if that was a result of casting when Elizabeth Moss comes in like is it a is it a, a process of a choice of adaptation or performance uh no I think it's it's in the writing and so once you once you take over the character and you start to write pages and you start to write drafts it's interesting you say that because it's feel it's I you know you've I've forgotten the experience of reading the book because you know I've lived with Kirby now for so long um I think for me, you know, when I was adapting her her character, the the idea of trauma was really important. So I was leaning into all these years later her experience of trauma. And the other piece of mythology that I added was that her reality keeps shifting. And so because of that, obviously that changes the character. So it's not, you know, it, in the six years since her attack, if her reality keeps changing out of nowhere that obviously is going to change how she moves through the world. Right. And just to, you didn't want to give the log line for the show, but uh, just, I, it's not a spoiler to say the show's about a time jumping killer. Uh, and actually that was going to be uh, uh, my next question. Like in the, the, the one other difference that seemed uh, pretty, oh, hello. This is the real Grendel. <laughs> oh, real Grendel. Hi. Um, uh, uh, one other noticeable difference is that uh, the killer in the book, um, uh, 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 Harper, uh, is a, he, not bumbling, he has like an instinctual uh, knowledge of how the time travel works, and it's more instinctual, he's not clever about it, he's not uh, uh, twisting time in a, in a, a, a way that benefits him, he fumbles through it more and he just has like the instincts of a killer but not like of a uh someone cleverly exploiting the time travel but in the show just in the two episodes i've seen the killer very much seems to be in control of the process and of the time travel process and uh is a lot smarter about it uh can you talk about that as well yeah. yeah I think it's also what time period so in the book you really see Harper when he first finds the house um, and then in our version, you know, he's been he's been living in the house and using the house um, for more time. But I, I will say I what I really liked about the book was that he wasn't 
uh, you know, time travel genius. This isn't some incredible, sophisticated man that you know knows how to wield time. And I liked that it felt like a small everyman that was insecure, as opposed to the really, really smart serial killer trope, which I think we've seen a lot of. Oh yeah, yeah, he's very insecure in the book. Very yeah. just. Uh, 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 well, I wasn't going to say it. Just, uh, just a horny little uh, sad man. Little sad man. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I was really impressed by the details of the book. Um, a lot of the details, you know, obviously a show and a book can't get everything right, but there were lots of fun details. I noticed in the, uh, acknowledgements at the end, a uh, friend of mine, Nell Taylor, who runs a beautiful place called Read Right Chicago, Read Right Chicago, uh, which sort of collects, you know, we collect, um, official Chicago history and Read Right Chicago uh, keeps the underground Chicago history. So I noticed they like uh, the book references things like Lumpen and uh, um, Steve Albini hates us and uh, some just fantastic detail that I would took me off guard. Lauren, um, she did a ton of research and she did share all of her research with me mm -hmm. um, when I first started the project, but she was in Chicago. She interviewed a ton of people. Um, Something I love in the book that we weren't able to get into the show was just there were a lot more time periods, which I think is like Chicago has such a rich history. Every era has its own prizes. So. Oh yeah, and for the the detail oriented uh, nature of the 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 book, were you researching uh, um, Chicago history as well, or were you relying on what was already established in the book mostly? I did a ton of my own research because that's just usually how I write. Um, so, but for me, what was really important was researching journalism, Sun Times. You know, how does the newspaper business work? How does the the rhythm of the of being in the newsroom? Uh, what are the different jobs? Like all of that felt um, it was built out a little bit more than in the book, mm -hmm. and so that was the that was the focus. And then, for I I don't know how much people have seen so, but for different time periods, I focused on those. Okay. Uh, yeah, sometimes um, we'll get into this later with Rich, but like sometimes, sometimes always seems to be the newspaper of choice for popular culture. Uh, I don't know why it is, but growing up um, in Virginia and South Carolina, um, uh, uh, Chicago was the sometimes, even though the Tribune building is the more iconic building um uh, i i think i i was totally unaware of the tribune tower mm -hmm. but the sun times building just i don't know because it happens at the curve of the river it was always in the background of a shot on a tv show or an opening credits of a sitcom and um if a person worked for a, it was a journalist in a movie or a tv show they worked for the sun times never mm -hmm. seemed to work for the trib so I, I can tell you as somebody who didn't know Chicago well before I started researching the newspaper really was a romantic figure for me just because mm -hmm. the characters were so colorful and it is an everyman paper it's an underdog paper and you feel like you're just rooting for it um, yeah. and there's something about that that's really special um, well speaking of the history and uh, recreating it on screen I guess we can bring in uh, Martha now Martha Sparrow uh, you were the art director on the show correct yes yeah hi and um, you're currently uh away working on a new show right now um you mentioned earlier so yeah always, uh, i'm working on a show in uh in new york at the moment called poker face which is a new natasha leone series oh very nice little plug for that okay um yeah thanks for joining us can you uh as silka told us you know what a um creator does in a, in a show like this can you Give us a little bit of an overview of what you do. Uh, yeah, yeah go ahead. Um, I come I come onto the show and um, you know read Silka's scripts and um, and start to look at what the sets um, will be for each of the scenes. Um, my job is I'm sort of in charge of overseeing all of the the creation of all of the sets, um, all of the graphics and props, um, construction and scenic work that happen on the show. Um, so, you know, bringing to life the visuals of everything that's written in the script. Um, yeah, and you work a lot in Chicago, I, 
I saw on your IMDb, as long as IMDb is trustworthy in this situation. Um, yeah, you've done Chicago before and Chicago in different time periods. Well, actually, I don't know, because you worked on Fargo, which filmed all around the library two years ago. But for that show, uh, Chicago was standing in for Kansas City. Is that correct? Yeah, it was Kansas City in 1950. Oh. Um, so yeah, I, I was lucky enough to be brought into Chicago to help with that show. Um, Kansas City in 1950, uh, they shot in Chicago, um, a lot for the cast. Um, they, they, uh, you know, they looked at different shooting in different places. Um, they were looking at shooting in Canada, which is where I was working at the time. Um, but they picked Chicago for its, uh, you know, its film base and also its great locations and its uh, cast. Yeah, sure. I, I guess it can stand in for most uh, gray Midwestern places. So, yeah, there's a there's a lot of really great locations, um, you know, in and around Chicago. We ended up, you know, out in the countryside, um, as far south as Pontiac. Um, doing some rural scenes. We were in some smaller towns outside of the city as well that, you know, we found little streetscapes that were kind of abandoned and, you know, still a lot of the architecture from the 50s was still there. So mm -hmm. it really gave us a lot of um, opportunity. Um, and more on the Shining Girls. Uh, and, oh, well, I, by the way, it's just Shining Girls. It's not the Shining Girls. It's Facebook in that way. Uh, so, uh, I, I, questions about that, like, I'm wondering what your experience is and like, uh, creating the show, the book and the show have spaces that are very real and events that are very real, like, uh, the flooding downtown in 1992 in Chicago, the Chicago Sun-Times bullpen, um, and, uh, it's got, you know, uh, things that are uh, imagined in the novel. So things that where there, some of the groundwork is already laid, but are imagined spaces. And then there's just fully imagined spaces in the show that, you know, you have no reference point to. Mm -hmm. um, can you, is there a preference for, for what kind of space, like a, a real space, a, a previously depicted space, or just a fully imagined space that you like creating in a show like this or? Um, I think I think they they they're all kind of similar. Even imagined spaces come from from references, and even real spaces have a certain amount of creative um, intervention that you do for television or film, um, just because of the way that you might like to depict space and you know characters moving through it or creating depth for the camera, so you have lots of layers. So, you know, even in creating, recreating the sometimes um, offices um, and the newsroom, um, we, you know, we looked at a lot of research photos, um, which uh, Rich and, and a lot of people at the sometimes helped us out with. Um, and then we also looked at how the camera might see the space. And so we did, we did take license and invent, you know, certain things like a, um, the room where they meet every morning to go over the uh, the daily um, work for the day. We put it kind of more in the middle of the space and put glass around it so that you get lots of depth through into the newsroom so that you're never kind of stuck in in a, a just a blank um, small space. Um, so yeah, and you know, imagine spaces when I'm working on uh, you know shows like The Handmaid's Tale. Mm -hmm. where, um, you know, our world is a kind of fictitious take on um, America. Um, even in those spaces, there's references to real things. And I think that's what kind of makes spaces feel so authentic and makes the experience of, of watching, you know, the characters go through their experiences is that there's very grounded pieces of reality, even in fictitious worlds. Yeah, and speaking of imagined spaces, the show and the the time traveling element of it to uh, uh, alter the space. So you know, yeah, in episode two, there uh, the character Kirby, the Elizabeth Moss character, her reality is changing. Her reality is altered uh, within the context of the so show. So you've got to create not only her apartment uh, and her apartment, which 
you know, gives her a, um, uh, tells you something about the character and her interior life and her uh, uh, situ situation, but it's going to change throughout the show. So. Yeah, and I think um, Silka's scripts were were very um, visual and challenging in those subtle time shifts. It was, we had a lot of meetings about, you know, how do we show the difference between 1982 and 1992 in this one particular space? Or how do we show that four years has gone by at this point? And so, you know, coming up with those subtle cues that um, point to a time period was a huge part of creating the sets for the show. And that just what was so incredible was just the practical challenge of using the exact same space and transforming it so many times. And what I was so impressed with um, from Martha and Kelly is just every single shift, it felt like a completely different character and how they were able to, to, to make that so effective so that you would notice it as the audience. And there was a specificity to every single, every single different uh, incarnation of it. Yeah. Um, and Martha, we've got a, a little short slideshow if you'd like to uh, yeah, I just, pull that up. I thought it, it might be nice to share some images. Um, are you going to share? Sure. Should yeah, I? absolutely. Give me just one moment. Um, just to show a few of the, the things that we looked at when we were creating the sometimes uh, newsroom and um, creating the the flood, which was one of the the sets in the first episode that was based on the Chicago flood. So th this is a picture of the Sun-Times newsroom in 1998. Um, and it was one of the um, pieces of research that uh, a few people at the Sun-Times helped us with. Um, and so we wanted to create this feel of a very chaotic and uh, you know, slightly mismatched world. Um, wh one of the things that stands out immediately is the technology whenever you're in a different time period. So finding those computers was actually a huge challenge and getting all of that to, to function. Sure. Um, uh, yeah, if you go to the next one. Yeah. Uh, here's, yeah, just another um, scene from that same environment. So elements in this are in our set, uh, but again, we've kind of rearranged them a little bit to create a bit more depth um, for some of our meeting rooms. And if you go ahead to the next one. Well, while we're going through this, uh, I haven't introduced Richard Cahan yet, but uh, I'll just briefly introduce him and uh, see if he, I'll stop screen sharing and just, we'll go back to this, but I just, uh, feels like we should introduce Richard at this point. Uh, Richard uh, Cahan was uh, the Sun-Times photo editor um, for many years uh, and uh, has released a book of Chicago. Um, help me with the title. I'm sorry, I should have written it down. Um... I'm not sure which book you're talking about. Oh, the most recent one, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, Chicago Exposed. Yeah, from the Chicago Sun-Times Photo Archive. Um, yeah, I just wanted to bring you in here because Thank I you. can't help just in case you accidentally show up in the background of one of these photos. Okay. Make sure you've been properly introduced. I took most of them, so I probably won't show up in any of them. Oh, okay. So these there, are your there, photos. There's some, there's some that we got from, uh, from Facebook. Online. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, I'll go back to screen sharing now and we can get back to the slideshow. Go ahead. Uh, this picture, from my understanding, was the, the day they, that everybody was vacating the building before it was um, torn down. So the technology and the, you know, the, the desks even are newer than the environment that we recreated, but they had some within that collection of, of photos. Uh, there were some really great pictures of some of the other spaces in the uh, building. Um, if you go ahead to the next one. So we created a 3D model to uh, design the space and kind of look at how the camera might see um, the room we were deciding to create and what size it needed to be, what the desk layout might be. So if you want to flip to the next one, um, you know, you can see here we, we kind of created a hallway in the back with the lockers that were in the main newsroom at the real sometimes and created a, a meeting room in between so we could get lots of nice depth in between all of these areas. And if you go to the next one, um, and this is, you know, one of our main characters is the edit, one of the editors at the paper. And so this was the view from her office into the main space where we could see all the other characters interacting. 
and if you go ahead to the next so this is the overall set um we built it in a studio uh chicago studio city which is um out towards austin and um we needed to also create a view um, from the windows of the set out to the city so you can see on in this model we have a backdrop um, drawn in so if you go to the next one um, this is uh, the photograph of the backdrop that we created this was a big endeavor we had um, a photographer come in um, to to photograph a whole series of pictures day and night and stitch everything together into this massive, I think it was 150 foot long backdrop. Um, and if you flip to the next one, um, this is, you know, the, the sun times in its place on the river. And obviously, if we're shooting a contemporary photograph, uh, the skyline has changed quite a bit since um, our setting in 1992. So if you flip to the next one, um, we had to go in and sort of meticulously research which of the buildings were, um, were there in 1992 or what would you see um, from the sometimes position. So this is um, a little diagram that we gave to the photographers and the um, visual effects department and they took out some buildings and they um, recreated the original 1992 uh, skyline for our view from the windows in the sometimes set. Um, and so this is just a picture of under construction in the studios, putting everything together. And then if you go to the next one, this is as we start to um, bring in desks and more details. And then if you head to the next one, this is a still from the show itself. This is so funny seeing all this. I haven't, it's like, <laughs> it's going down like memory. I'm just like remembering so many conversations. Uh, yeah. We talk so much about desk placement because yeah. I think what Martha's glossing over is, you know, the, Michelle McLaren, the incredible Michelle McLaren who directed our first two episodes. Obviously, you know, she has shots planned. She knows how she wants to move around the space. She knows how she wants to block the actors. So it's this, balance between you know what's real what makes sense and then just creatively what's actually better for the director uh, but it takes a, you, we move the desks a lot basically yeah. uh, <laughs> Richard, I, oh go ahead martha sorry uh, yeah we had we had lots of input too from different people at the sun times as to how um how a newsroom is arranged and you know where the photographers hang out which is actually in a separate space which Richard filled us in on um yeah I was just going to ask if this is uh, uh, evoking you know the time period if it would have been more cramped more awful less sunny how do we do Rich <laughs> I'm amazed I'm amazed by it all I was watching the show uh, speaking about going down memory lane you know to see your past there uh it's too clean uh, that's about my, my only criticism. Um, it's just spectacular. It really, um, I know Richard Roper, when he wrote a, uh, uh, his review of the show said it was uncanny and it just places you right back. Yeah. You guys did a fantastic job. Where did you get the old computers? That's what I want to know. Martha. <laughs> yeah. But from various places, um, there are collectors who collect these things and, um, Phenomenal. You know, oftentimes they end up in prop houses now and get, you know, a rare opportunity to go to 1992 on a show. But yeah, we, we were such a little ragtag organization. There's a picture earlier that you showed of the newsroom. And in the 90s, most big newsrooms had massive TVs all over the place. You know, it's just the kind of showing that you were covering the world for some reason. And in the picture, it shows two little TV sets over the editor. And it just reminds me of. What, what a ragtag place we had. But I was, love that detail. We had, we put that back in because it was like, they were just sort of like hanging off the wall, yeah, right, <laughs> like right. anchored in in case somebody wanted to like take them or something. Exactly. <laughs> and the fact that the chairs are all different and the desks are painted kind of different colors. And uh, what happened now? Is the studio still there? Is the, is, is the Sun-Times room still there, newsroom? Or do you get rid no. of it? No, we took it down. So, yeah. It's, it's really spectacular. Thank you. Yeah. 
Uh, any more slides you want to talk about? Um, well, I just put in a few. I put in a few slides as well for some of the details. Um, and this is, you know, the stuff that uh, several people at the Sun Times helped us out with. If you go to the next one, um, you know, we we managed to get images of a lot of the the smaller details that we used in props of how they would store negatives. Um, how they would store news articles, which was something that our character Elizabeth Moss character did. She worked in the archives. So all of those sort of details were quite important to our story. Um, and if you go to the next one, uh, you know, like this is what the back of the photograph would look like um, when it gets used multiple times on different articles. And if you go to the next one, these are um, clippings files, which is how they would store um past events um which is very different from today so it was cool to get into these my mom's a librarian so you know i know all about card catalogs and um everything has changed so much now i think it's interesting for people to see it um recreated and if you go to the next one um you know we did draw first from other references as well this was the new york times archives uh, which they called the morgue um, and if you go to the next one, this is our space that we've created, which was the, the basement archives for, for Elizabeth Moss's character. Um, and if you go to the next one, I, I think I put in, yeah, this is one of the sometimes covers that was central to our story. Um, part of the story, there's a body discovered when um, the 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 flood of 92 happened. So um, we we actually came, you know, some of the researchers you were talking about, Josh, who came to the library, were actually looking for um, specific sometimes um, newspapers on the microfiche machines, taking scans of those and bringing them back to the art department. And then we would clean up the scanned files and create newspapers from them. So we created, you know, a whole series of newspapers and then throughout the story as well. Um, the sometimes allowed us to um, put our own articles within older papers um, and let our kind of story um, be depicted within um, some of the papers, from, the real papers from 1992. So we looked for, you know, some of the details we looked for were just the stories that were going on at the time, which was the flood and the aftermath of that. And then um, also there was a lot of uh, controversy about a, a casino deal that was going down at the time. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, still, still going on. Still going on. It's uh, uh, yeah. I don't know if you're following still Chicago arguing. news, but that's the the front page story these days. Mm -hmm. Our current, which is taking over the uh, well, the proposed one is going to take over the Tribune space mm. uh, on the river. So. Oh. Yeah, Bally's. That's the that's the accepted uh, proposal. So the Tribune. That's going to be a casino. Yep, uh, not the Tribune Tower, but the Tribune. Oh. Uh, 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 I guess the a production. The facility. production facility. Yeah. yeah, they'll tear it down and use that space on the Chicago River. Yeah. I was. Uh, I have a couple of questions uh, for Martha. Probably is uh, everything is so accurate in the um, newsroom, and then her office was a little different, fanciful, dark, and and with lights and things like that. Uh, I'm wondering why you decided to make that change. It's interesting. Did you want the contrast? Well, she's supposed to be in the in the archives in the, and so we put it in the basement. And I think um, we discovered that in the real sometimes it was actually. Uh, on the top floor. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and we we looked, we did try to find images and um, the best we could do was um, we got hold of one of the old archivists and and she described things to us. Um, and somebody drew a map for us of it as well that showed um, where the you know reference books were in relation to the microfiche and um, so we we worked off that, but I think more so than the newsroom, we kind of departed a little bit. I think it was a lot about the character. Yeah, um, I, I think it's it's coming from the intention of wanting to feel like she starts out the season, you know, in this dark space, distant from her dream of being a reporter, and that when you kind of go into the newsroom, it's really exciting, it's bustling, there's light, uh, and making sure that they're there was a contrast, like you were saying, between both of them. So that that's probably a bigger, 
that was a discussion with Michelle oh. and Martha and Kelly about it's more of a creative choice than a research one. Yeah. And you started with such incredible uh, detail, authentic detail. You know, we went over the cart many times. What exactly was the cart? And we went over everything. Um, you know, it would seem so much easier to just do a generic newsroom. Uh, but this is so much better. Uh, you know, why, why take the time and money to do it so carefully? Yeah, I, I guess it's Silke, you talked about it being a character. Uh, yeah, but also it was incredible. I mean, the like all that paperwork like all those slips i mean this the shelves like elizabeth moss could pull something out and there would it would be real they, they would have recreated that that is an incredible amount of work that yeah. is i mean to when you were in the spaces they felt so alive because oh, all those yeah. details and i think it helps the actors it helps everyone on set um it's yeah. it just becomes its own person I find I find within a real space there's things that you know you see in photographs. I spend a lot of time looking at photographs of of real spaces, and and picking out the details to recreate because that things happen in real life that you just wouldn't think up, like the kinds of things that people put in their spaces or those little signs or the little quirky, you know, ways that a space gets layered over time. Um, when you start from a, that kind of intense research, it, it just, the character is um, so much more rich. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say uh, from a librarian's uh, and archivist's point of view, I'll stop screen sharing for a moment. Um, if you can see me, uh, the, I've made the background the Winter Garden at the Chicago Public Library, and our archives are actually just right over here. So our archives are bright and sunny. And every so often uh, we get, uh, I don't know, like every once a month we get a news crew in looking at, uh, as you do, uh, people always look at microfilm uh, to look up old murders. That's uh, narratively what microfilm is uh, to most people. And when they do, they always want to use the machines from the 90s, always the, the old loud machines that you can't make nice digital scans of. And I always tell them, you know, we've got, we've got these beautiful things that take like high res PDFs and TIFFs, but uh, it's got it's to gotta fit within the visual narrative for most people. And I understand that. So I try not to. to uh, From viewers who've seen the show, the, the nostalgia for the archive, like this microfiche, all of that, that has been one of the biggest comments was oh, they really missed that, the process of it. I think yeah. everything with everything going digital, people actually like the tactile. Not many people make those anymore. Uh, we we had one company that will do it. Um, it you know you, you when I started in film twenty years ago, you could get them made in most cities, but now you have to send out for those to be made. Um, and yeah, I I don't know how much longer they'll stay uh, in business. Well, we're still actively getting uh, eleven titles in on microfilm uh, all the time, and there's plenty of old titles that have not been digitized and won't be digitized anytime soon, so. Look at, look at all the details on the desks that are no longer there, the, the big yeah. dictionary, the Rolodex, the old computer. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty fascinating, even this, even this picture. Yeah. Uh, any more slides here? Oh yeah, the flood. Yeah, these are just some pictures from the uh, sometimes actually from uh, when, the flood happened in 92. Um, and so we looked at, you know, the fascinating just from everything from the wardrobe to, you know, the, the emergency vehicles and then just how they were trying to deal with getting rid of um, water and airing everything out. Um, if you go to the next one, um, this was one of Michelle's favorite images. Um, and we, we recreated this. Um, with a biker going through a flooded intersection underneath the L. Um, if you go to the next one, this is just a, you know, a kind of behind the scenes, this is what the kinds of maps we make when we're doing a scene like this, which was a logistical, um, you know, it was a, a planning challenge. Um, every drain uh, down on the intersection where we shot at Wells and Lake Street, um, every drain had to be marked and covered. Um, and then, you know, some of these lines indicate the different pieces of piping that we were 
going to be dressing from going from buildings out to the street to create recreate the look of what happened after the flood and just you know marking out the camera angles so that people knew which way we were shooting and where the emergency vehicles would be placed so we got we got to shut down this intersection um and uh if you go to the next one we cre recreated the flood um at lake and wells that's great yeah um so i'll stop screen sharing there um so that's a, a great time to bring in uh rich again with the the sun times photos and the events going on at that era um what was your experience of were you taking any of those photos of the flood downtown were you no i wasn't taking any picture photos because i was working with photographers as, as the editor and the big okay. challenge as i told silka right from the beginning was we couldn't photograph the flood you know, it, it, it was underground. It was, you know, and so here we have this front page with a drawing. I mean, it looks like a, a newspaper from 1910. And, uh, but there was really nothing to photograph. It was just this kind of damaged pier. And uh, that, you know, so we really want, and, and we wanted to explain what was happening to readers. And uh, John Downs, who did the illustration, was a great, fantastic uh, artist. And he brought everything together in this illustration. But it, for a show about, Sometimes photography, it was frustrating that on our big day, we, we, we hardly took any pictures. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, as I was saying earlier, like the, the Sun-Times is the paper of record, at least in Chicago pop culture. Um, I, early edition, uh, the Shining Girls, Never Been Kissed, My Best Friend's Wedding, that one with Jim, John Belushi that I can't remember the name of that was constantly on television. Continental Divide. Continental Divide. Uh, yeah, the um, uh, it looms large in pop culture. The Sun Times. It was amazing how many movies were even done it during my years. I remember James Wood spent a night with us. Uh, uh, I think he just came in the paper just to see what it was all about before filming, and um, and we actually found his photographs in the morgue, and he signed the back of them. <laughs> so, uh, uh, we are. I don't. I don't know why. Perhaps the Tribune makes it more difficult uh, to. Yeah. To work with, I don't know. Yeah, I was wondering if that was a conscious choice of the sun. But I, I agree with Silka. We're kind of the underdog paper, and uh, uh, there was a famous moment in the early '90s when um, when this when when the Soviet Union collapsed, and we were all in the newsroom. And once in a while, in the newsroom, you say something not loud, but everyone else is quiet, and so it kind of filters around the newsroom. And I I, I said to everyone, who would have ever guessed that the Sun Times would outlast the Soviet Union? And we all had this moment of you know. <laughs> This is impossible, but we're still going. Yeah, yep, still going. Um, so yeah, uh, um, have you been able to watch the show, Richard? Yeah, I, yeah. I love it, and I, I agree that the paper is absolutely a character in the show. Fantastic. Um, so yeah, uh, very briefly, we'll uh, see if maybe there's any questions in the audience, or if uh, anybody would like to say anything else. I'll I'll take a look if there's anything in the chat. Uh, nothing at the moment, but I'll keep an eye on it. But uh, go ahead, Soka. I was just going to say, Rich, I'm so glad you were happy with the show. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I was thrilled. And uh, it really means a lot at the end of, you know, it really does mean a lot. So oh, I was thrilled with it. I hope I helped. Uh, enormously. I, I don't know what we would have done without having all of these resources and just even in writing and just all those details. Right. If I don't, I wouldn't have been able to make it all up. Yeah. It's one of those things where people who don't live in Chicago are writing it and they're just using kind of the wrong term here and there. And uh, if you live in Chicago, it kind of, you know, you, you go ouch when you hear it, but, but I think I we there was one note. I, you said that there was too much cursing in the script, oh. and I and I think I left the cursing in. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. I'm, just, I'm an older guy, so I'm still not used. No, to it. that was interesting. Like how the office culture has changed. We right. have we have more cursing, less smoking. I think in the depiction in our depiction right. of it. That's great. Um, yeah. Oh. Uh, um... Adriana in the chat asks, what neighborhood were the residential scenes filmed in? Well, I know Wicker Park because the character lives in Wicker Park. And I know you guys filmed at the Rainbow right there on Damon and in the heart of Wicker for a while. I uh, drove past that quite a bit, but go ahead, sorry. Yeah, we were, we were out, um, Dan's house was out at, in Humboldt Park um, in that area. Um, 
we filmed at one of the bars near Humboldt Park to like kind of the Ukrainian village. Um, we filmed. Um, where was the house house? Where's where's Harper's house? I can't remember the name of the neighborhood. Yeah, I can't exactly either remember the name of the neighborhood. Um, the Wicker Park stuff, um, we did film the exterior of uh, Kirby's house down there, but we actually built the apartment. So that was um, something that we did in, in studio. Um, oh yeah, I noticed when she's going up to her apartment, it's uh, at Richard's bar. Her, her mm -hmm. apartment is above Richard's, which is on Grand. It's not really Wicker, but it's an iconic corner anyway, right. a longstanding bar. And then actually her stairwell was a stairwell in a building that was in Pilsen. Um, we were shooting a different scene down there and we kind of fell in love with the stairwell. Um, and so we shot some of it in, in, the, in a building in Pilsen and then we recreated that stairwell in the studio as well, which was a challenge because it was very quirky. There were a lot of different odd details in there uh, that we had to recreate. Um, yeah. The, the house house harper's house is shot in lawndale but so like that's just the exteriors and then the interiors martha and kelly created right um and the adler planetarium uh of looms large at least in the first uh, two episodes um yeah and obviously that's real and has been largely unchanged for uh, a long time so it's except uh, interestingly they were um they were renovating their roof when we were shooting, yeah. like exactly in our time period of our shoot. So we had to CG the roof um, <laughs> and we weren't able to get out onto the roof to shoot. Um, we scouted it and it was beautiful out there. And, um, you know, there's all these scenes uh, written out there. So we actually had to build the roof um, on the studio lot and we we recreated it essentially for the exterior shots of the roof. Okay. Um, well, uh, I, I guess we can wrap it up here. I'll uh, just thank everyone. And uh, Richard, uh, like I said, your new book is Chicago Exposed, uh, digging into the archives of the Chicago Sun-Times photograph collection. Right, and you can see photographs uh, from the book and uh, at the at the Chicago History Museum. There's an exhibit, ongoing exhibit of sometimes photography that I think is worthwhile. Yeah, and uh, Silka and Martha, the Shining Girls. I keep saying the Shining Girls. Shining Girls uh, is still a couple new episodes left. Uh, Apple TV rolls them out uh, one a week. So what are we five in? Six. Six We've in. Got two more. Okay, two more two to more. go. So. Check that out on Apple TV and uh, anything else you all would like to say? Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. This was really nice. Thank you all. All right.